it's Maggie about here for a board game vlog number two of my vlogist. That means I'm vlogging every day in August. Come hell or high water, I'm doing it this year. Uh, and that means that it was my day off, so I had a little extra time. So I'm gonna take a very, a little more in-depth look at Nornberg. This is a two to five player game from uh, White Goblin Games. And this one, unfortunately, never came out in the States. So they never produced it for the American market. And so, though it is really readily available in Europe, it's hard to find out here, so you don't hear people talking about it. However, I think after you see this, everyone and their mother should start emailing White Goblin Games that we'd really love to see this licensed and put into the States. Heck, if Stronghold Games or even um, Stonemaier Games wanted to do a game like this, it'd be really beautiful because one thing that this game has that is not my normal novelty, but I like this novelty, is just some really beautiful production value of novelty meeples. So, the game is represented here. I've set up kind of a five player game, though it's just me in my living room, so I'm not gonna play every round or anything. But I put out all six guilds. These go in a specific order, starting at the beer hall and going to the bakery and then the shoe store. And you see they have little numbers at the top so you know which order to put them in. Each guild has some craftsmen, people working there and making those crafts some goods so you have these meeples that are in the the shop and they're very limited and you also have some lodgers upstairs and so you as a player are trying to collect the resources of a given guild to get its favor you're also trying to take in lodgers from their shop windows by paying goods into that shop um, there is very little randomness in the game. This is Andreas Stedding who did Hansa Teutonica and he also did Stoke for Dynasty more recently. And the randomness of this game is a little draw pile. Um, it, I didn't have an opaque bag on me so I used this little fat pack box. But what you'll do is you'll randomly draw the lodgers that go into the tops of every window. And the lodgers are either more craftsmen and they're not guild specific when they go in the windows, it's just whatever you draw. Or they are townsmen who have special abilities. And the special abilities can be actions you take immediately and then shuffle them back in. Or they can be in-game scoring tiles that will give you extra points for different things. Because the points in this game are a little hard to see. And so if I had two things to suggest for a reprint, it would be handling the money a little bit differently. As you can see, I have this very flat, beautiful vault token. This goes on top of my coin money so no one can tell how much I have. I think the solution to that would just be making the money one-sided so as you're collecting or spending it, you, it's face down. That would be one thing. And the second thing I think is just some of the, the things like a draw bag would be really nice for this. Um, so <laughs> now that I've talked your ear off about what the game is, a little bit more about how it plays, and then I'll just talk about my thoughts. This is not going to be a full overview, just a, a good look at something that really uh, more people should have been able to enjoy. So every round you're going to have a hand of cards that are all identical from player to player. So each card represents one guild out on the board, so it has their little crest on it, and this one corresponds with the paper place, paper mill, paper where they produce the paper or <laughs> newspaper. Um, so at the same time, or if you are a little more tenacious about winning a game, you can ask for this to be done in turn order. Players are going to choose cards, one or more, depending on how many actions you want to spend that round, and you set the cards down in front of you. No one else knows what you've got, you set them face down. Each player can play as few cards as they like, but they must play at least one card or else they are out of the round. So let's say we've all decided, and we put our little passing token on top of the cards we're not going to be playing. And then, whomever the loudest person is, usually me, will go through each guild one at a time saying, did anyone choose the beer hall? And players that have chosen the beer hall would then flip over and present their card. After everyone's said whether or not they're going there, the players will take actions in that guild. And then it goes to the next guild and the next guild, and you take all your actions in that order. Different actions are either buying or selling goods, or taking in lodgers, or passing. And every time you pa or you do take an action, you're going to add one of your action pawns to the roof. 
And so eventually, once the roof starts becoming full, there's lots of ways of taking advantage of that because if you take in a lodger from a guild, you'll get money based on how many people have taken actions there already in the round. So it's pretty important to balance that one properly. Other than that, most of the fun of this game is the economy because it's very weird. <laughs> I can't really think of another game that does this. So as you see, each guild starts with just their goods. So if I were to take an action in this guild, I could buy up to three of a commodity of my choice. And each craftsman sets the price. So the one that's at the end here is a three. So it's going to cost three this round. But you can see the economy is a future round. So the next one is a six, the one after that is a seven, and the final one is a two. That means that I know if I buy cupcakes this round for three money, next round they'll pay out six if I'd like to sell them back. This is where the, the big, big part of the game comes in because there's very few things that are going to change that. There's one townsman that allows you to switch craftsmen around where you can affect prices for the future, but that's really it. And so what you're trying to do is kind of play the market a little bit, getting in some extra cash and cash is going to help you buy the things to get the majorities because what you'd like at the end of the game is a little bit of everything. You'd like to have the majority of a given type of craftsman. That's good for you, it's worth points. You'd like those craftsmen to equal at least 30 for a little bit of extra points. You'd like to be the richest player for a little bit of extra points. But most of what you want are these crests. And they don't necessarily win-win the game for you, but they're very important for a good chunk of your points because each unique crest you have at the end of the game gives you more and more points every time. So I think it, I don't think it's triangle numbers, but I think it's similar to that. There are also prestige crests. One guild every round is considered to be the most prestigious, and if you get prestige crests, they count as a whole nother unique one. Even if you have multiple unique you, it, multiple prestige crests, they're all unique, and so they add onto that number very quickly. Um, the person last night that we played with, we played our first five player game, which is really exciting and fun and I would highly recommend this at five. Um, they ended up taking over the beer hall, round one, and never letting it go until all the way at the very end of the game she finally sold the beer, but she was sitting on five or so beers and so she kept getting the majority in that beer hall, even though having majority the crests don't help you if you have multiples of the same one, but she prevented anyone else from going there, anyone else from taking advantage of the beer pricing, and she also forced us to kind of play in fewer crafts or fewer guilds than we would have normally. Uh, very interesting. She kind of kept her eye out and spitefully grabbed things as they were coming up. One of my favorite parts of the game is actually the townsmen that appear in the windows. So normally the townsmen up here, you have to pay some amount of goods for them. And so let's say I have a boot and a cupcake. If I would like this townsman up on the top, he costs a boot and one good of any other type. And what will happen is I'll pay that boot and the cupcake to the shoe store. And now the shoe store has a cupcake that can be purchased there for the boot price. So you can affect prices of goods that aren't necessarily produced in a given guild because people will be paying for these lodgers up in the windows. And that was probably the most important part of this whole game is that you could move things around and find that one extra boot for a little bit cheaper or take advantage of um, an underpriced hat outside of his own guild because the hats were very expensive. Um, very, very cool and interesting. Um, and there are and I don't think it's a bad thing in this game. Normally I would not be a fan of this, but there are definitely ways of getting more actions around than other players. So everyone has uh, eight pawns, but you only start the game with four. And so as you go, there are different tiles that give you access to another pawn, and you get to play them that round when you get them. And so players will have different amounts of turns based on how many pawns they've been able to make or, or earn. <laughs> so. All in all, a fantastic game, so low randomness, really good playtime was only like two, two and a half hours for a learning game at five, but I'd played a three player game that was a little more reasonably timed at about an hour and a half, but I would play this for hours and hours. Um, really interesting and always, always gonna feel a little bit different. Um, I know that people like modular boards, but these aren't double sided or anything like that. 
Um, the one thing I will, I'll start putting out word here that I need, and I, I emailed White Goblin, I hope to hear back from them, is that my copy came with four fewer blue meeples than it needed. It needs eight and it had four. So if anyone knows this meeple shape, knows where I can get one, I would very much like to complete my set. Until then, we've just basically been picking up random objects around rooms and using them as the extra blue meeples, um, which was pretty funny last night because we had donkeys and so we made a lot of ass jokes. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to see more of this game, I um, know that they sell it in Europe and I have not seen it on Amazon.de, but I have seen it there before. So maybe that's a good place to start. <laughs> All right, everyone, that was my vlog number two. I will see you again tomorrow. Bye.